Stories of redemption. Prodigal sons returning, heart of gold hookers reforming, captivate the gullible. Does a self-described master thief, who honours his parents, respects authority, sympathises with the poor, and steals only from strangers, deserve our approbation, envy, or respect? Not my idea of how to pass the time before dinner, but some philosophizing needs doing. Confident sort of a git, is he not? A wiser man might just have eaten, kissed his mum, and run. But up he goes to the Count's castle, and tells all. I would have kept on walking, frankly, to China. But our thief's a proud bugger. He disguises himself as an old woman, laces a cask of wine with knockout drops, and returns to the castle. Without witnesses, the thief wraps the horse's hooves in rags and silently rides away. Next, the countess's wedding ring and bedsheet. The thief lugs a corpse he's collected from the gallows through the count's garden. Hmm, this promises to promote some mischief. Oh, please, what an unperceptive dolt she is. The master thief silently walks away, and under cover of darkness, he takes a long sack and a lantern to the village churchyard. With some hermit crabs and wax candles, the master thief creates some creepy lamps. Promises of Judgment Day always attract a ready audience. To the holy, or those who wish they were, a clever disguise and a compelling line of apocalyptic patter can be very convincing. The master thief has only to turn over his catch to the count and win his escape from the hangman's noose. So he left. No one ever heard from him again. Blah, blah, blah. Jeez. Am I the only one who was in Gaga for Tales of Redemption? And who's redeemed anyway? The thief? He repays his parents' unrequited love by disappearing. Forever! Big show-off! If this resolution works for you, please get out in the world more. If not, play on. At least there wasn't a wedding in this episode. <laughs> the master thief visits his parents at the humble family home. Why now? Given his profession and his long absence, I suspect an ulterior motive. I likes me motives ulterior, you. <laughs> this conventional boring village just became a lot more interesting. Arboreal locomotion is, dare I say, unusual. And I smell a motive. The thieves' father blathers on and on about twisted trees, etc., etc. What might he say if they suddenly became murderous, moving monsters? Let's put it to the test. They eat flesh, you know. By the look in his eye, eyes, whatever, he's determined to exterminate the source of this evil. What? What the heck was that? Ah, I wasn't scared. Were you? The brilliant brigand dabbles as a do-gooder. He's secretly searching for the cause of this gross and unpredictable evil. If a monster lurks beneath the Count's righteous exterior, he must be exposed. Since our thief has been away, the Count has become enamored of Dracula. The professional purloiner now has work to do. The Lord of Larceny's first task is to steal the Count's war horse. He dresses up as an old crone. How boring. I'm nodding off already. Let's kick it up a notch, shall we? What the hell? No, I always breathe like that. The Prince of Pilfering successfully steals the horse. That beast looks much too tame. No pets allowed. The Outre outlaw seeks to fool the Count and steal his wife's ring and bedsheet. But one corpse wouldn't fool a child. Let's gather some more. Does the Count really think a single pistol would protect him from world's best bandit's army of the dead? <laughs> he needs a bigger arsenal. Maybe he's from Texas. Now the professional purloiner lifts the goods, 
Why doesn't he take the Countess while he's at it? Make it breaking and entering and stealing and <laughs> kidnapping. Easy way to get the ring. Yeah, cowboy! Ride them, little zombies! yee In his last test, the creative crook must steal the parson and his clerk from the local church. These little crabs are not going to lure them out of their glory hole. Let's bring on the apocalypse! The master thief has done everything required of him. Time for a face-off against the evil count! Make it a monster mash! We need some angry villagers! Yeah! Get angry! Wave that pitchfork! Swing that torch! <laughs> now we need some angry monsters! Come on, people! Put some... <laughs> into it! Let's make them deal with each other the old-fashioned way! One more reason why Halloween's the happiest holiday on the calendar! Zombies! Wraiths! Vampires! Werewolves! All messing with the status quo! Woo! Look at them go! They'll be fighting till the sun comes up! Then, poof! They'll never know what hit them. Parents probably think Master Thief is a better career choice than Vampire Hunter. Steadier work, fewer occupational hazards. Thieving for the hunter is just part of the job. So many little requisites come up when you're tracking down depravity. Not available for love or money, and you really can't hire any decent help. A suspicious stranger, outlandishly dressed, and funny looking, if I do say so, turns up in the midst of gruesome doings. What else would he do? Go to the Count's castle. Believes that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Finally, characters who understand their roles in the great scheme of things. We're familiar with the Count's wicked tasks. First, steal the horse, then take the ring and sheet. Wind up with extracting two creatures from the church. Nothing basic changes, though the overarching supreme evil thing alters some of the particulars. The ring and sheet are next, but a ruse of misdirection isn't going to get it done. The monster hunter aims a little higher and gets help from an unexpected quarter. Great idea! Take the ring wearer and the whole damn bed! Zombies are surprisingly willing. Perhaps they found being used as a vampire's toothpick demeaning. Now to the church! There haven't been any human inhabitants in this deconsecrated hulk for years. Two werewolves use the Nartex as their home base. The Count did not stipulate the condition of the creatures. He did not say, bring them back alive. The Master Thief has fulfilled the Count's conditions. Let the battle royal begin. Massive carnage! Order of the day, Colonel Blimp! Grim reporting for duty! Last man standing is a friend of mine! Conflict resolution the old-fashioned way! Woohoo! Well, someone that bad, you almost hate to see them go. Upsets the balance of the universe. On the other hand, turns out the Master Thief had more than a little mean streak. He won't lack for work on Halloween. May all our stories end so well. Until next time. <laughs>
having murdered his brother and buried him carelessly in the sand where he fell, he took the boar to the castle to collect the reward. This warning was insufficient to deter the ambitious criminal. After all, he'd already killed his brother for the chance to marry the harpy. For many years the crime was concealed, the murderer appearing to have got away with murder. But one day, a local shepherd was moving his flock beneath the very bridge where the killing took place. Now this shepherd knew a portent when he saw one, and he took the singing skull to the king straightway. Thought there might be a reward, no doubt. Always nice when royalty behaves predictably. Like jerks. Poor man was just looking for a little love and maybe some money. The bones of the foully murdered brother are gathered and given a proper burial in a beautiful tomb. Well, that's all right then, I suppose. This passes presumably for all's well that ends well. But it doesn't end well, does it? And what happened to the little guy who gave the fatal spear? Does he have responsibility in any of this? I mean, where's the accountability? Ever since Cain killed Abel, there's been a nasty corner in hell reserved for fratricides. Brother murder unhinges the world, and the death of the killer does not redress the crime. It only begins to heal a gaping wound. If you'd like to see better effects, play on. A gargantuan pig is said to be ravaging an innocent and defenseless populace. Really? No evidence of it? No gore? Not a single drop of blood? Tcha! Six Emperor Portis! Oh boy! Yee-haw! <laughs> Make them squeal! The people lament the boar caused chaos, but it appears to have fatally impaled so few of them. A decent massacre would justify their complaints. Whoa, whoa, ah, wait! Come back, you obstreperous hog! You're bound to be bacon and good riddance! Ah, porca miseria! Two brothers tell the king they'll track the beast in the menacing forest in exchange for the princess's hand in marriage. But it's not the forest they should be afraid of. Ah! Princess Pigpuss is on the loose. You're oinked, boys. Run for your lives. Save your bodily parts. The younger brother encounters a peculiar little person who gives him a spear to slay the boar. That little thing, maybe it works for a midget, but not for a monster. You call that pig sticker a spear? That's not a spear. Now this, this is a spear. Only room for one of us in this forest short stuff. Let's go find that boar. A single toss pierces the beast's heart. Bah! After a dispute with Matron, my nursery was bloodier than this. Better make sure it's dead. Now that's a fatality a la Grimm. Teach you to abandon me, you muck lover. Your bristles will make someone a really big brush. While one brother's been hunting, the other's been boozing to build his courage. And now the coward snags a chance to make his brother's prize his own. Well, who could blame him? But to seize the boar, he has to get everyone inebriated. Breath Eliza be damned. I know stinking drunk when I see it. Floozies and boozies, take a message. Drinking and cart driving don't mix. Junior gets a heavy club to the occipital lobe. It's murder by numbers. One, two, three. But we'll be counting all day at this rate. Let's make it quick. <laughs> the old coin drop head bash maneuver. Surprisingly effective. At last, this latter-day Cain has slain his Abel and stolen the dead man's prize. The boar. His just reward is yet to come. The murderer presents the boar to the king. Having killed his brother, is there any depravity to which he wouldn't sink? Why not drink the beast's blood? The porcine princess is back, and not so easily evaded this time. Fratricide finds its own punishment, and in this case there is something worse than death. Marriage! The killer marries the princess. A crown gained through murder is damned. Hadn't this dope heard of Hamlet? Let's damn it up good! 
Though the murdered brother didn't get a wedding invite, he and his boorish friends crash the party. Puns are the lowest form of humor, but what can you expect? <laughs> run, idiots, run! A shepherd finds a piece of the murdered brother's skull, and the bone sings a song describing his demise. Doesn't everyone love a melody of murder? Let's make that bone wail. London Bridge fell? Why not this one? <laughs> Suicide's not an option if someone murders you first. That death's head looks like a toy. What this story needs is a shocking, scary, flaming skull. Now that's more like it. This vile skull isn't about to play second fiddle to a dim-witted shepherd or his sheep. Oh, here, I've got it. Fly me to the moon. No, no, no. I'm leaving on a jet skull. The shepherd brings the bone to the king, where it once again croons its damning tune. Oh, sweet revenge is so close at hand. The king orders the guards to capture the wicked brother, who, not surprisingly, tries to run away. This evil man joins his brother among the dead. He'll be food for fish rather than worms. With only the odd crustacean to keep him company on his final voyage, let's give him some traveling companions. At last, the murdered brother gets a proper burial. We should all be so lucky. Well, aim low, my dears. Now where's that boar? I want to have gore fun. Come on, you undead zombie boar. We have some villagers to gore. Presenting the deaths of two brothers as if they were the regrettable culmination of a high-stakes tit-for-tat lacks imagination. When very good and very bad collide, the result is never a compromised and limited okay. Settle for nasty! The desperate and dim-witted king offers the equivalent of his second-best suit of clothes and a three-legged goat to the person who will kill the boar. Perhaps the villagers were being punished for eating pork every day. Observant Jews and Muslims were strangely safe from the beast's attacks. <laughs> Two claims, one lie about the national average. Well, not quite a high colonic, but bracing, I'm sure, and effectively lethal. Tally-ho! The die was cast, the murderer's plan exposed. No need for subtlety. Foolish, boorish, overreaching dolt. This was the first and last time he would issue a command. The criminally moronic brother was expecting a stripper to emerge. He deserved the macabre surprise. And he never had another peaceful night's sleep. But his suffering had just begun. So many miserable, tortured, suicidal souls had chosen the plot beneath the bridge as their final resting place that the brother's skull had to do something to get noticed. A passing shepherd was the beneficiary of the performance. Who would blame the shepherd for being frightened? He was familiar with the expression, kill the messenger. They do the right thing by the dead brother, presuming he didn't want to be cremated. A death for a death. An eye for an eye, as they say. But who got the last eye? A village was decimated, and a killer pig got porked, and then a good man got murdered. A bad man got executed. A father lost two sons. A princess became a widow. A king lost an heir. Hmm. Lots of losers in this life. May all our stories end so well. Until next time. Divine intervention in human affairs was a hot topic in tales almost from the moment people began to talk. The ancient Greeks larded their lore with the deeds and misdeeds of their anthropomorphic deities. What a pathetic fallacy! The Olympian god Apollo and the divine satyr Silenus Marcias are about to engage in a friendly flute-off. The smart money's on Apollo. The muses are his half-sisters. But Midas is a king and a sucker for a compliment. Olympians rarely settle for second place.
Having backed the loser in the flute contest, Midas conceals his trophy ears beneath a Phrygian cap. This ruse worked for a time, but when his hair grew too long and wild to hide under the cap, he had to seek the services of the royal barber. Thinking the or else might be very unpleasant, the barber regains his self-control and assents. But soul possession of such a secret overcomes him, and he finds what he believes is a mute confidant with which to share it. The barber's discretion is foiled when reeds spring from the hole and rustle the king's secret. Midas becomes the laughing stock of the country. Wonder what happened to the barber, hmm? Dionysus and Marcias, a couple of divine tipplers, are roaming in Midas's backyard when Marcias, seriously inebriated as per usual, becomes seriously lost. Little did he know. Takes the dim wit a while to realize that he'll soon starve to death, and he seeks out Dionysus, hoping he's sober, I imagine. Fortunately for Midas, he knows where that is. Perhaps Midas learned a lesson, but I'll bet the greedy pig thought twice about keeping his family in gold. I would have done. Zeus and his son Ares, the god of war, witnessed this entire fiasco. Well, that was no Iliad, no tale of divine retribution, wrath, and unearned misery. But it could have been. If you'd like a different outcome to this little Greek war, play on. You might well ask why these Greek deities are constantly interfering with human affairs and making nuisances of themselves. And the answer is, they've got nothing better to do. Check this out. Smitten by Zeus, father of all the Olympians, and as bad-tempered a brute as you'd care to meet. Wish he were my dad. Silenus Marcius and the divine Apollo compete with flutes. Midas, ever the fool, deems Marcius the superior blower and gets donkey ears for his trouble. That's punishment? Let's make a real ass out of him. And make that hideous music stop! Ah, yes, cacophonous perfection to my ears, not to mention Midas's. Midas tries to hide the fruits of his stupidity under a hat. Let's give him some more divine attention. Shockingly delightful. Get a move on, Midas. We have a story to defile. His barber discovers the outsized ears and doesn't do anything. Oh, no. He's hysterical. He's unsteady. The king looks like an ass. He nipped the royal ear with his scissors. Or he should have done. More blood would improve the mood. The barber whispers his secret into a hole. What a wimp! He discovered the emperor without clothes. Let the whole world know! After a three-week bender, how can the gods of wine and drunkenness even stand up? This is ridiculous. They should both be plastered. Falling down, stupid! By Zeus, even after the donkey ear debacle, Midas holds no grudge against Marcius. I like grudges. He even helps the silly satyr find his way home. He missed his chance for revenge. Let's give him his vengeance. Grim man rides God. Only in ancient Greece. Dionysus rewards Midas by giving him the golden touch. The gods are mischief maker with a bizarre sense of humor. We're going to make Midas regret his greedy wish right away. Now he's just hungry. Let's make the whole world golden. Ah, Midas, after his whole family has turned into golden statues, finally realizes his folly. So Dionysus lets Midas escape from the curse he brought on himself. And there's no punishment for his idiocy? No repercussions? I don't think so. This ought to be a catastrophe! Now that'll make him think twice about being greedy again. But what do the rest of the Olympians think about this outcome? Do they even care? Zeus and Ares never had what anyone would call a healthy relationship. Let's exploit their mutual lack of love and respect. A well-aimed kick from Ares ought to do it. Oh yeah! Clash of the Fighting Titans!
And the moral of the story? Avoid musical contests and be careful what you wish for. <laughs> the old saw, beware of Greeks bearing gifts, falls far short of the whole truth, doesn't it? When the gods are involved, keep your hands to yourself and your mouth shut. Things are rarely what they see. Midas wishes the gods had held this party on somebody else's patch. Midas, an egotistical, vainglorious narcissist, has taken extreme measures to conceal his ears. The barber was not about to become another casualty of his profession. He out Midas Midas. The friendless barber, with a keen sense of humor and self-preservation, shares his secret with a hole in the ground. When humans drink to excess, crockery gets broken, hard words are spoken, and an occasional fight breaks out. When gods overindulge, all hell breaks loose. What's it now, does he? He refuses to consider the consequence of his wish. Enough useless questions. Trust Midas to put false face on the catastrophe he caused, and the Olympian gods, jealous of their powers and big on object lessons, remind him that he made a big mistake. Zeus and Ares keep picking at one another. Midas and his behavior with Apollo and Dionysus is just a cover. They've each consumed thirty hogsheads of nectar. Tempers are frayed. Well, that's one set of preposterous but deserving deities down the rat hole. They took Midas with them. May all our stories end so well. Until next time! If you know the German or Chinese versions of this tale, you're better off. This Cinderella panders to the emotionally decrepit and mentally deficient. If you've eaten recently, be forewarned. Melodrama is as hard on the digestion as it is on the heart. Once upon a time, when dreams were more than wishes, the blameless wife of a wealthy man fell mortally ill. The difference between wishful thinking and a lie is often undetectable, but claptrap is easy to spot. Father's a swine. He consoles his grief with a new wife. Perfect opportunity for her to slit their throats, or at least show the disdain they deserve. But she persists playing the dutiful daughter, as if anyone cared. Dissatisfied with provincial life, the harridan drags them all into town to be closer to the royal family and its loathsome sycophants. She is friendless, deprived of a real name. Her father tolerates her tormentor and the insulting moniker. The stepsisters almost soil themselves. So excited are they on reading the royal announcement. Most would be loath to say it, but she brings this on herself. Copious weeping is as tiresome as it is ineffective. If tears were weapons, she'd have conquered worlds. But as they are not, she is merely wet. So rather than whacking her tormentors with a red-hot poker, or inflicting other damage on them, she calls on her deceased parent for succor. She goes unrecognized. Surprising, no? Unbathed after her hard day's labor, she dances with the prince and steals his heart. Well, there's no accounting for taste. A midnight expiration of magical powers is just silly, isn't it? Sunrise, maybe. Not, hmm. Not a particularly romantic turn of phrase. Perhaps she thought of using dogs. Doesn't that thing stink? She's been dancing all night. So, based on a twirl or two round the dance floor and possessing only her <sniffs> odiferous shoe, the prince searches for the love of his life. They're alleged to live happily ever after. Typical. This ending does not satisfy. Nothing suitably gruesome happens to her family. They behave abominably and earn nothing for their conduct. I ask you, when cruel miscreants go unpunished, what good's a happy ending?
The German version of Cinderella, for example, after engaging our sympathies with parental abuse and rank discrimination, delivers a satisfying meal of fortuitous resolution, seasoned with harsh revenge. If you'd prefer a tale where the guilty, mean, and stupid receive their just deserts, play on. Mm. Cinderella's mother falls ill. Looks like she might hang on for days, doesn't she? Let's make her sicker. Oh, yeah! You're better than Typhoid Mary, spreading death and mayhem like one of the horsemen of the apocalypse. My kind of gal! Cinderella's mother is put to rest. Mourning cleanses the soul. It's not supposed to make you happy. They all ought to be sadder. Woo-hoo! She won't stay dead. No wraith, no wrath, like that of an undead mother. And zombies don't discriminate. Whoops, here we go then. Over to the other side. Feels a little slimy. Nice, though. Cinderella's father quickly remarries. I despise a white wedding, the crying, the hypocrisy. Let's make it a black wedding. Zombie Mummy is back. Talk about an uninvited guest. But this wedding party deserved to be crashed. Well, they all do, but this one especially. Cinderella's family moves to a new home. A compulsively cleaned home begs to be messed up. Cinderella's new family force her to do some dirty chores. She's named for one of them. Hell, she should be covered in ash. She'll be a cinder soon enough. Look at her go. Into the pigsty. Never heard stop, drop, and roll, I guess. Now she's a cinder and she stinks. I date her now. Baby. Her stepsisters are going to the ball. Cinderella looks sad. Wrong emotion. She should be pissed. Now she's freaking pissed. Oh, that's got to hurt. Perfect. The sisters will go to the ball, liberally doused with eau de grim. Cinderella wishes for a dress and a carriage. That ceremony needs more malevolence. Cinderella's magic carriage takes her to the ball. Oh, such sweetness risks regurgitation. The prince falls in love with Cinderella. Oh, love, I feel ill. Why should I suffer this alone? Am I not a royal person? Let's all be ill. I proclaim it. Oh, goody. Take that, love. Oh, oh, almost midnight. Run, Cinder, run. Oh, yeah! Grand Theft Pumpkin! The love slave seeks his princess. That shoe must stink. The wicked stepmother's artful knife work couldn't forestall the inevitable. The prince and Cinderella are finally married. Blech! A perfect revenge is laid on the mean, petty, and cruel. Justice truly is blind. Or at least blinding. Excellent, dear little pigeons. When's the last time you heard that? When will the next time be? Now here's the world as it is. Cinderella was not simply an ill-used ninny who married well, forgave her tormentors, and lived happily ever after. She was innocent. She was abused. She was harmed. Her pain should be paid for. Once upon a time... The wife of a criminally obtuse man warned her daughter from her deathbed. This was a vain wish. Her husband couldn't protect a belfry from a bat, and he has a wandering eye. Better she'd choked down her hope and died in silence. When the truth is shoved down your throat, it's still the truth. This girl knows she's been abandoned. She knows her father's a selfish, randy dimwit and dangerous to her on that account. Father wastes no time finding a companion for his bed. Still in his widower's weeds, he hauls home a frightful hag encumbered by two repulsive daughters. These depraved louts deserve more than kicks to their broad backsides. Their time will come.
Well, the bitch's intentions are clear to anyone with a bit of sense and the will to use it. The insult is palpable. Father is mute. Cinderella is on her own. I report with relish and a modicum of disgust that when the stepsisters read the royal daily blat, they soiled themselves and otherwise behaved in a disgusting manner. Her first act of disobedience is at hand. A violent incantation summons her deceased mother from the netherworld. Evidently the spirit world shared her anger. She hooks the prince without breaking a sweat. Cinderella leaves the prince in a state of feverish intoxication. Marriage was less important to her than her self-respect. Her worthless father was chastened, her wicked stepsisters blinded, her cruel stepmother physically wrecked and ruined by envy. Her mother stays dead, unfortunately. Even hard revenge can't give everything. Feels better, doesn't it? Like when you lance a festering boil or carbuncle and the pain flows away with the oozing discharge. <laughs> May all our stories end so well. Until next time. Only in fairy tales could a numbskull be a hero. Bearing an unprepossessing name is nearly a requirement. It's guaranteed that something good will happen to him, no matter how unlikely or undeserved. The Golden Goose is appalling proof. Father sends his three sons to chop wood, perhaps believing that idle hands do the devil's work. As soon as they enter the woods, the would-be lumberjacks encounter a peculiar old man. Something good? Maybe there's a goose with feathers of pure gold sitting in the roots. Dimwit gathers it up and walks to the nearest town. Curious girls whose greed conquers their discretion try to steal some gold and feathers. The moment they touch anything that has touched the goose, they're held fast and dragged behind Dimwit like a lumpy tail. And she gets her share of deserved ridicule. But there's more fun to come. A nosy parson's sense of decency is outraged by the bizarre procession. What a fiasco! But hilarious! Everyone who witnesses these fools tripping behind Dimwit and cursing their own stupidity is in stitches. Gotta love that! And the king's daughter does! The king's not happy that his only daughter has fallen for a dolt with a retinue of morons. After a moment's thought, he sets three tasks. He doesn't know where to find a world-class boozer, so he returns to the forest where he found the goose. There, he meets a man who says his thirst can't be quenched. Imagine that. And takes him back to the castle. Confident that a wine will be imbibed, Dimwit sets off to find the consumer of a mountain of bread. Naturally, he returns to the spot of his previous success. And once again, like a royal mounty on a roll, he gets his man. All gluttons must now. Finally, the ship that sails on sea and land must be secured, and Dimwit returns to the well. And the little old man with whom he shared his food provides the unique ship. Here comes a wedding. <sighs> the inevitable wedding causes inevitable illness. After the king's death, which couldn't come too soon in my view, Dimwit inherited the kingdom and lived contentedly with his wife. Oh boy. Made for each other, I'd say. Over the top, isn't it? Dimwit's generosity might be commended, but not so handsomely rewarded. The king's tests are seriously odd and dopey. Does the princess really want him for a laugh? Where's the goose, by the way? And shouldn't he change his name? Think of his children. Oh no, I wouldn't stomach it. I'd play on. Won't you? Father sends his sons to chop down trees. Why? I'm serious. The weather's fair, the cottage is in good condition, he's not in the lumber business. Why? Looks like mindless punishing make-work. His son should show him what they think of his program. When the selfish older brothers deny a request to share their food and drink, did an uh-oh go off in your heads? Danger! Danger! Always a terrible idea to thwart a dwarf's desire. I know, I saw a whole website about it. <laughs>
Dimwit, despite his name, does not make this error. He wisely shares his meal and drink and receives mysterious instructions in return. Yes, I'll allow he has a gentle nature. He may be compassionate, if a bit dull, but he's not much of an axe man. He's never going to chop down that tree and collect his reward. Let's lend him a sausage. The usefulness of a sticky golden goose is completely lost on me. I'm more a show-me-the-money type. But in this case, I'll settle for lepers. Roll on, big boy. Even a committed curmudgeon would find something laughable in these greedy or meddlesome misfits. Can't blame the princess, but given Dimwit and his crew, can't really blame the king for trying to welsh on the original marriage deal. He demands that three conditions must be met before the wedding can be celebrated. Dimwit, the poor sod, must find someone to drink a whole cellar full of wine in one go. Dimwit better find a souse that can swim. I'd sink like a stone. He actually finds someone to drink the contents of the wine cellar, but the guy doesn't look like he's had enough practice. Make him more of an inveterate boozer. Imagine that. Dimwit has actually managed to find a person who wants to eat a whole mountain of bread. But he's being too careful not to eat all the bread people. He needs to be more voracious. Here he comes, like a wave consumes a sandcastle. Totally, brutally, quickly. Uh-oh. You've got five seconds to spit me out before I fart in your windpipe. Five, four, three... Dimwit finally gets married to the princess. Yuck! How about we bring our golden goose back? Uh, and maybe change his name. Goosezilla! That suits him! What a creature! Oh, divine duck, you're an inspiration! Now fly away! Wreak havoc another day! Ha 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 That's going to leave a mark! Okay, set course, second star on the left. We'll sail until we find some isle of cuteness that needs to be set right. Perhaps Yoshi's Island is on our route. We'll find it before too long. <laughs> now the story has a shape I can relate to. The unanswered, unpleasant, or unspoken questions have a voice. Nobody gets to be as lucky as Dimwit without some practice. Sure, he had some help, but he knows how to beat the devil. Failing to motivate his sons with words, father encourages them to become useful family members by other means. Certain amount of family strife promotes economic imagination and inventive use of vulgar insults. Once in the woods, a mean-spirited dwarf accosts the brothers. He heads for town, a changed man, looking for the main chance. Uh-oh, several people sticking fast to feathers, while seemingly a stretch, makes perfect sense if the goose is in fact a huge leper ball of death 5,000 in disguise. That little guy wasn't kidding when he said Dimwit would find a surprise. Surprised he didn't ask if she was a virgin, but off he goes to find a practiced tippler whose capacity can empty the king's wine cellar. Well, we know he's short in the brains department, and it turns out he doesn't have much of a heart either. Where did that malevolent dwarf find all these outsized appetites? He's my kind of guy. Drinking and eating accomplished, the ship is everything it should be. Dimwit delivered on all counts. The crew looks familiar. Hmm. Oh, be still, my heart. Those swabbies are pirates. I could only hope. And Dimwit, oh yes, he is well and justly named. Logic is served, even if it doesn't taste so good. Whoa, who saw that coming? The golden goose returns and earns its fame. Scuttles a wedding, destroys everything and anyone in its path. Sinks a ship. Mission accomplished. Doesn't get much better than that. May all our stories end so well. Until next time, when a disobedient child recklessly jeopardizes the lives of countless innocents for the sake of a toy and is rewarded, we know we're upside down in fairyland. Do even dribbling dreamers desire such a place?
The forest has been off limits for years. Now, an ambitious huntsman claims that he can bag the homicidal maniac who lives there and render the woods safe for decent people. Well demanded, son, but reasonable questions find few answers in fairy tales. They find the fiend and dub him Iron John. Well, why not? Looks more like that creaky, heartless tin head from Ozlan to me, but who cares? They lead him back to the castle without a fuss. Strange what passes for monstrous. But as all trivial pursuits are ripe occasions for disaster in Grimm, the prince's golden ball rolls into the cage. Oh, cruel Iron John. For three days running, the prince returns and asks for his ball. Each time, Iron John denies him, so to speak. But on the fourth day, the boy takes a new tack. Quick as boiled asparagus, the boy brings the key and opens the door. When the king and queen find an empty cage and their son gone, they guess what has happened and much grief reigns in the royal court. Stupidity does not preclude sadness. Back at his forest hideaway, Iron John orders the prince to let nothing fall into his well. But the careless lad has already touched the water with his hand, and a stray hair has wafted in too. Both have turned to gold. The prince wanders aimlessly, and then finds work at the palace, first in the kitchen, and then as a gardener. After some years, his appearance earned him the notice of the royal princess, but nothing really happens until a war begins. All that he asks is done, and soon he's riding home on his three-legged horse, happy as a clam. Don't expect logic from a king. When he hears about the feast, the prince calls on Iron John and asks to catch the princess's golden apples. And Iron John says, And each day the prince, in sumptuous armor, catches the apple and promptly rides away. Like I said, logic? <laughs> During the chase, the prince is wounded and loses his helmet, exposing his golden hair. And the princess recognizes him as the gardener's helper. Not standing on ceremony and long engagements, the deed is done. The prince's parents attend the wedding. How they found out about the nuptials, who knows? Telepathy? Smoke signal? Coded message? Carrier pigeon? Invisible ink? Telegraphy? Message in a gum wrapper? TV? No bloody idea. Well, there you have it. The ridiculous eclipsed by the incredible. Enchanted? By whom? For what reason? Cursed to be filthy rich and magically potent? And how did the prince set him free from this miserable estate? Not relevant, evidently. They all live happily ever after, I'm sure. Well, they would, wouldn't they? Nonsense comes in many flavors. Do I detect a whiff of camel dung? A murderous fiend terrorizes the surrounding woods, and nobody gives a horse's patoot, no paralyzing fear. No raging anger? This situation demands panic and desperate resolve. Get it? Now this is looking good. Let's make sure enough blood will flow freely. The wild thing, a.k.a. Iron John, is lurking in a pond. Good choice for a toad. For a mammal, not so much. The pathetic plan to expose him will take all week. Let's give them more than a hand. Ah, they're drowning. My, all those swimming lessons for naught. <laughs> oh, and he's metal. Now the man of steel, not, has been set free. No, they capture him and take him away. Speaking of, I'd better be off myself before those kiddies' parents show up in a snit. Very hot items, these golden bowls. Fairy tale royals love them. Iron John's caged in the courtyard. But where's security for this cold-blooded killer and the signs of his struggle? As for the prince, let's take that grin off the brat's pie face. When the dim prince rashly approaches the cage, he snatched and forced to release the steel creature. Whoa! This metal man has rockets on the soles of his shoes. Whee! Next stop, the arboreal hideaway.
This enchanted well has the Midas touch. The prince, in his usual stellar style, guards it. I'm shocked he's only turned his fingers gold. This is preposterous. His failure has to put Midas himself to shame. We should gild this lily. Oh, hey, hold up there, metal man. The boy did bad and turned everything to gold. <laughs> Our little prince goes to Uncle Iron John and requests an army to defeat his king's enemy. Can a three-legged horse still carry a person? Their journey should be more miserable. A good old-fashioned war on a massive scale to settle a dispute. I like it. But why is nobody dying? Why is everybody smiling? What are the eviscerations, heck limbs, decapitations? War is more than heck. Can robots lick the dogs of war? Whoa, there's a whole lot of terminating going on. The brothers never knew how sweet a thousand kilowatt death laser could be when properly inserted into a fairy tale battle. More's the pity. For reasons unexplained, the prince is treated like a crusading potentate by Iron John, and he wears armored costumes to impress the princess. Forget the apples, they're just a metaphor, a sideshow. A contest with a big, nasty weapon is more likely. The prince gets a new swish outfit, and he enters the joust. After kicking Major Butt in archery and jousting, he manages to win the sword tournament, too. The fix is in. Look at him. After defeating the final metal foe, he runs back to... Well, you know. Do I have to say it? Another quickie wedding. Jeez. Matrimony is said to be an honorable estate when not taken in hand unadvisedly or wantonly to satisfy carnal lust and appetite like brute beasts. So what should you call this sordid affair? Hmm? Oh, no, I do like this. Wedding crashers! Hey, put me down! I don't want to be probed! What is this? Mission impossible! I'm starting to like the probe. Not that there's anything wrong with that. This is getting tedious, isn't it? I'm thinking three royal families at the same table. Awkward! I'm hoping way before dessert, insults real or imagined are traded, and the facade of propriety disintegrates into a name-calling knockdown knife fight! Well, I can dream, can't I? The final showdown. Man versus machine. I'm not sure whose side I'm on. I'm just glad the wedding's ruined! <laughs> Any cake going? This at least makes sense. An indiscriminate, insatiable man-eater on the loose, and the populace shuffling about like somnambulists, wondering which of them will be his next meal. Or snack, can you whisper abject fear? <laughs> the villagers have a right to be frightened, I suppose, but I've seen zombies with more joie de vivre than these petrified mopes. Ah, you know the type. He means any sacrifice others will make. He's just there to pick up the pieces. Many of those who came to bail water are reduced to cinders and ash by the light. Their leader has exposed himself behind a boulder. The deranged automaton is a nice touch. Eliminates the how does it breathe under water query. A characteristically poor decision by the prince. But there's no tale at all without it. Some lackey at the royal palace took pity on the hapless prince and gave him a job as a scullery boy. After many years in the kitchen, the prince's ambition kicks in, and ill-prepared and ill-equipped, he goes to war. The prince showed little initiative or skill in his youth. We're not surprised that his later years are similarly uninspired. Oh yeah, here comes the good stuff. Weird, I'll admit, but good. No kidding. When he said he was a tool, he got it just right. Who wouldn't run away from this? But the prince is captured in the end. The wedding date is fixed. The stupid wedding is unavoidable. But the outcome, not inevitable. Prince Connor's not that impressive. Perhaps Iron John liked the kid's smile. All powerful doesn't mean all smart, evidently. May all our stories end so well. <laughs>
Until next time. In this version of the tale, the resourceful Piper appears as a benign and insipid camp counsellor, and the feral rats are pets. Not in my world, thank you very much. They carry lethal parasites, breed like... like rats, bring interminable disease and destruction. Warning! This is a build alert! Hamlin here is a pretty little town with a huge rat problem. But don't tell the mayor or the townspeople. The mayor is trying to turn an infestation of malignant vermin into a wholesome, cuddly family attraction. Pets my Aunt Fanny. Would he take tarantulas to bed because they're warm and fuzzy? Ah, an appeal to the meaner instinct. Pets or food? Often an effective ploy, base creatures that we are. Finally, the mayor shows a scrap of sense. He negotiates a deal with a piper who has a distinguished record for rat removal. The piper's siren song leads the rats from the town. I was counting on strains of show me the way to go home. You might as well offer matches to pyromaniacs. These rats were perhaps not as clever as some. But they were moved by his inducements. Imagine! They all jumped onto the barges. Now the piper appears to have solved the town's rodent problem, as agreed. But the mayor is apparently trying to stiff him. Now here's a difference of opinion that should have resulted in bloodshed. But no. The piper's thinking, I'll pluck this chicken another way. He hatched a plan and waited for a holiday. Family Celebration Day finally arrives, and the patient Piper presumably has vengeance on his mind. What'll he do with all these brats once he gets them inside? They'll want to eat and drink, then get sick, stop for toilet breaks, won't shut up with questions, and he's still got no money, and the mayor's still standing. Is this anybody's good idea for taking revenge? Since the parents don't care where their kids have got to, why should we? Unless there's something indecent going on. What are this man's intentions, anyway? Nothing good, I'd venture. But it's a mystery. So the creatures responsible for more human misery than anything else nature could concoct are pets. And the children, fatuous dupes. And the piper... A nice but ill-used guy with a lonely heart. Ah! If you'd like an emetic to relieve your nausea, play on! The town of Hamlin is beset by rodents. To Hamlin residents, the plague of rats just meant there were too many. These people don't know the meaning of plague. Wait till they start vomiting and peeing black. Then talk to me about plague. Let's make it dark. Nibble nor scurry and bite, we'll show them what screeches at night. You'd better squeak and squeal, you'd better scratch and bite. Grim likes it like that. <laughs> the piper offers to rid Hamlin of its infestation. Why offer when you can extort? Let's help the man make a rotten deal. <laughs> a little cheesy. But smashing good fun, nonetheless. The Piper's tune lures the rats away from town. Seems a bit cheery for a death march. Let's make this procession darker. Whoa, who doesn't love a giant rat? You know, I was born in the year of the rat. <laughs> the rats are loaded onto ships. <laughs> That's no way to treat them. Let's drown those buggers. These rats don't get to flee the sinking ship. I hope they clog up the sewers. The mayor refuses to pay the piper. A cheat I like, but a stupid cheat? Let's make sure he gets what he deserves. The villagers celebrate life without rats. It seems they've forgotten the piper. But what's this? He's not forgotten them. Ooh, this should be fun. Oh, goody. Revenge is my favorite. Come now, let's join in the dance. Ha! Nabbed their kiddies. A suitable revenge. 
Perhaps the start of one. Let's see where the pipers tune in. Piper holds children captive at his mountain hideaway. Oh, sweet revenge. The children are now the pipers. But captivity is hardly punishment enough for these fools. Let's take it too far. Nothing like a good sacrificial rite. Let's finish these bastards off. Rain, rain, go away, let it rain, rats today. <laughs> and that, as they say, is the end of that tale. The end. The rodents were a menace. Ever hear of the Black Plague? Know what started that scourge? Rattus, rattus, that's what. Killed millions. Not their fault, really, but it's their nature. Much misunderstood, the rat is. Still, they had to die, and much other collateral damage done, too. Oh, yes, that was the fun part. Rats ruled the town of Hamlin. The residents were all destined to become rat chow. Rats are insatiable, indiscriminate eaters with bad attitudes and no moral qualms to speak of. No such thing as a few rats. Think orders of magnitude. They come with relatives. Just when things seemed like they couldn't get much worse, a person in a preposterous costume arrived, claiming he could save Hamlin from extinction. A man not afraid to put hair on the head of a cogent threat. That's the man for me. A little crazy, no doubt. But can he deliver? You can lead a rat to water, evidently. Was that a slow boat to China, I heard? Probably didn't want to spoil his surprise. Rats leave sinking ships. They're enthusiastic swimmers, so hoping they'd drown would never do. The piper knew his business. A pregnant and horrible threat. But the mayor's a hopeless optimist, as well as a dim-witted cheat. The rats are gone. The worst is over. So make an enemy of a piper in a funny suit. What's the harm? Delusions take many forms. He seemed destined to insanity. But being cheated didn't help. Happy endings are an illusion. The Mad Piper's apocalyptic vision required suffering and the demise of everyone but himself. So, screwing a guy in funny clothes with no aversion to risk who makes a living killing vermin who's pretty obviously sliding along the naked edge of sanity is a huge mistake. If you make a deal... Live with it, or die with it, but there's no one else to blame when you Welsh. May all our stories end so well. Until next time. This time-worn tale satisfies the meagre standards of the holiday season. A badly damaged man regains his faith in humanity and finds redemption. Hmm... Can one's loathsome, mean, and lifelong habits be conquered? Nah! Ebenezer Scrooge, inveterate money grubber, pays Christmas Eve no mind, except to resent it. Another excuse for malingering, he thinks. After fourteen hours of soul-numbing toil, he returns to his solitary abode. And a surprise! Unimpressed with Marley's threat of ghostly visitations, Scrooge falls into a deep sleep. The second spirit is the ghost of Christmas present. With him, Scrooge witnesses the modest, pleasantly indulgent aspects of the holiday. Marley promised three spirits, so the ghost of Christmas yet to come shows up. Spirits one and two made an impression on Scrooge. Change your way of life, blah, blah, blah. But three seems to really scare him. Scrooge takes the spirit's advice. He thinks it over, or dreams it over, or whatever. And he tries to redeem his selfish, heretofore nearly worthless life with a small shopping spree. New Scrooge's generosity is not boundless, it seems. Nothing wrong with a little holiday cheer, as long as people remember where it comes from. Sometimes a hot toddy does as much good and is more welcome than a kind word or a pair of roller skates. Now, where's my flaming rum punch? 
as the cacophony of competing holiday bells escapes into the foul-smelling frigid air, Ebenezer anticipates a quiet evening of counting his coinage. Again, the firm of Scrooge and Marley reunited. My, my, and they take tea and chat like a couple of pensioners. Phooey! Let's help Marley deliver a dire and persuasive warning from creatures beyond the mouldering grave. The old coot is in for a rough night of revelation. Let's enjoy the ride. Our Scroogey is an introverted, conceited little bookworm with no friends and an aversion to bathwater. Phew, explains a lot. He deserves to be alone. This place should be desolate. Young Scrooge's girlfriend leaves him. Why, I wonder? A difference of opinion? Pshaw. Opposites attract. They seem well suited. They ought to have a real reason to split up. His fiancée marries another man and squeezes out a litter of brats. Could a couple with that many underfed and uneducated children be happy? No way. Let's make them accept their folly. Time for the next lesson, Scroogey. Let the misery roll on. The ghost of Christmas present intends to show Scrooge the true meaning of Christmas. But the pageant is incomplete. Where's the commercialism? Where's the slavish desire to buy bigger, better, and more every year? Make this real spirit of Christmas come alive. Ah, jolly old Saint Nick, the standard bearer of Christmas cheer and goodwill. Blah! More like the personification of wretched excess and greed. Let's show him his true colors. Greed is, for lack of a better word, good, they say. Hey, Santa, let's split the loot. Whoa, wait just a moment now. The third spirit gives Scrooge a glimpse of Tiny Tim on his way out of this life. Timmy doesn't look critical just yet, does he? Ah, like us all, he was born to die. Let's hurry him along! Oh yeah, a classic daylight snatch and grab at Scrooge's house. But hold on, where are the requisite tools of the trade? These bungling street rats need a refresher in burglary 101. Let's help them liberate Scrooge's goodies. What a service. Let us mourn the, uh, thrifty gentleman, Ebenezer Scrooge. Friend to, uh, uh... A few, benevolent to, uh, a fewer. A not completely dislikable. No, no, that's not right. Let's show him what they really thought of him. Scrooge wakes up with an overpowering desire to buy presents for everyone. He's a changed man. The turkey spend merely hints at his newfound commitment to consumerism. He needs to indulge in a veritable shopping spree. Whoa, was that a street riot or precursor to a run on the bank? Whatever, it's a righteous instance of the law of unintended consequences. An act of generosity turned nasty by selfishness. So predictable. I love it. Despite the potential for personal injury and aggravation, there are people who will join a queue without knowing why their fellow time servers are standing in line. Ignorance meets unfounded hope and greed. Perfect. Let's make it huge. This turkey isn't nearly big enough to satisfy Scrooge's newfound generosity, but a holiday meal must include a beautiful bird. Who knew Tiny Tim could do that? Hiding his light under a barrel, crutch and all. Gets him out of the housework, I suppose. Nothing better than a titanic intraspecies death match when the loser provides a decent meal. Turns out Tim's a hero. Christmas was the occasion and Scrooge the means of initiating his success. Now it's time to get even with another bogus holiday icon and ambulatory bowl of jelly. Santa!
I'll teach him to cross me with some good old-fashioned yuletide payback. Giving really is the best part of Christmas after all. One down, two to go. Reminds me of my so-called childhood. Dysfunctional. One more round! And now for the grand finale! Ha-ha! There's that jovial tub of congealing lard! Now that's a sleigh ride! Know what happens when a reindeer tastes human blood? Me either. Let's find out! Finally, the Christmas presents we all deserve! Merry Christmas, everyone! Ho, ho, ho! <laughs> Our Dickensian frolic is now properly tuned. Modern practice has hijacked the true holiday spirit from the Christmas carol. We'll sing quite a different song. The grumpy cheapskate motivated by discomforting visions is a relic. Our Scrooge needs more than advice to make his conversion. Ah, commerce conquers all. Grasping, acquisitive, mindless consumption. This is what Christmas has become, and the wreck it has wrought. Despite the hypocrisy of former days, there was potential when a juicy orange was the best possible present. Scrooge's attempt to make amends takes a nasty turn when the shortage of conventional poultry turns decidedly weird. Is too much of a good thing worse than too much of a bad thing? A true conundrum. Christmas should never be about material things. That's a vile abomination. A hideous perversion. Hmm, you'd think I'd like it. If there is anything to celebrate here, it's the blow against false values of the season. As for the real values... They'll have to look out for themselves. May all our stories end so well. Until next time, ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas to all, and to all, a good nightmare. <laughs>